I'd like to welcome our Peter Wells lecturer, Cassie. And we're trying to work out how long we've known each other. It's a, it's a good decade. And I think both of us have kind of gone, known each other through our early 20s. And now we're not in our early 20s. Um, and we kind of grown and changed a lot. Well, I've grown and changed a lot. Um, Cassie, when we asked Cassie to be the Peter Wells lecturer, she wasn't the director of Action Station, and now she is. And I feel like probably we had something to do with that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Cassie has been working in um, doing youth work space, in the youth work space, anti-racism space, workers' rights space. She is an incredible person and speaker and just force for good, like one of the best people actually, and I'm just so pleased and proud to um, invite her to speak to us today and I think that you'll be moved and get so much out of her words because she always has very good, interesting things to say. So come on up, Cassie. Ko papatuna ku ke raro, ko ranginui ke runga, ko ngā tangata ke wainganui, tihei mauri ora. Tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā koutou uh, tuatahi ki te mana whenua o tēnei rohi, tēnā koutou ki ngā ahikā o tēnei rohi, tēnā koe, tēnā koutou, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, ki te rōpū, ki ngā rōpū o... O te kai hautu tanga, o te kai tiaki tanga, o te nei rohi, te na kouto. Te na kouto ki ngā kuia, me ngā kuraua, me ngā pakeki i te nei ruma, i te nei hapore hoki, te na kouto. E ngā mati o te rā rohi, o te rā rohi, haere rā, haere rā, haere rā. Te na kouto ki ngā kai whakahaere o te nei rā. Same, same festival. Tēnā koutou moto mahi. Moto mahi ngā kou, moto mahi nunui. Ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Ai. I ahu mai au i whia. I te tau toku pāpa, no Ingarani, no Kotarani, no Itaria ahau. I te tau toku māma, ko Tararua, te maunga, ko hoki o te awa. Ko Ngāti Raukawa, ki te tonga, te iwi. Ko Ngāti Pari Raukawa, te hapū. Ko Ngā toku waru, te marae. Ko te whatanui, te tangata. Ai, i whakatipu aki ahau ki te awa kairanga mi whanganui. Engari, kei te noho au ki te whanganui atara i nai nei. Ai. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora everyone and, and thank you for choosing to be inside on such a beautiful day. And, and, and maybe this is really normal for you, but, um, but in Wellington, if you've ever been there, you'll know. <laughs> you'll know that it's never summer, first of all. We have this saying, right? And the, have you heard the saying? You can't beat Wellington on a good day. Can you raise your hand if you've ever heard that saying? Yeah, you know why we say that, eh? Because there's so few good days that we just have to reassure ourselves that there's a reason why we live in the windiest, coldiest part of the country. It's just a self-assurance tactic, 100%. So it's beautiful to be here in the heat. Thank you. Um, Sam has already introduced me, and I would rather get into... Um, I would let my words, I would rather let my words speak for themselves tonight. And in order to do that, I want to start off by quoting um, the intro, the editorial to a piece of work uh, that took three years to birth out. <laughs> it was a very, very messy birth, I must say. Um, three of us young women. One, me, one, a friend, Ella Grace McPherson Newton, who actually lives in Tamaki Makoto, and another friend, Nadia Abu Shanab, who comes from Palestine and England and New Zealand. We worked together on a project called Aunties. Aunties was a magazine, but really it was a guidebook, a how to guide for how to 
keep the revolution going, basically. And we decided that we wanted to breathe life into the archetype of the auntie because we knew it was the aunties who'd really kept us going all this time. You know what I mean? It was getting the kai cooked. It was doing everything behind the scenes. It was holding us. It was loving us. It was offering us wise words of wisdom every time we need it. A little bit of a slap on the wrist whenever we needed it too and a kick in the gut when we need that too. Um, and so we centred a whole collection around the archetype of the auntie. And this particular kind of auntie was the political organiser auntie. Um, and so we had many people in there, such as Sue Bradford, Tina Ngata, Mani Mitchell, who was more of an aunt cool, I think, than an auntie. Um, and a range of different people that we looked up to admi and admired who we thought could teach us what we needed to know about political organising in Aotearoa and Te Mwananui Akiwa in our current time based on the lessons that have been learnt from the past. And this was the opening line to that magazine. Kia ora. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. You're meant to be here. This time and place is very particular and unique to us. We face a number of challenges to our collective survival. We share an awareness of these challenges. Sometimes it makes us feel heavy and lost as we struggle to find our place. We came together to make this magazine because you're not alone. You shouldn't feel like you have to face these things by yourself. You can't and you shouldn't. The contributors in these pages have some insights to share about how we not only face our challenges, but how we transform them. Out of the darkness, new life and potential can grow. Sometimes there'll be more darkness ahead, and there'll also be more light too. That's the point. There is no road map to a better future. There's only our collective imagination. There's only being in motion, propelled by possibilities making mistakes and fucking up, doubting ourselves, seeking advice and wisdom, working it out, moving through these cycles. Even when it feels like everything is stuck or stagnant, there is still movement. Let's move together. In the spirit of moving together, as Anya Suchanam will tell, tell you, I do have a youth worker background and I will make you talk to each other for a whole second. I would like, and again, in the spirit of moving together, would you please just turn to someone who you don't know? Yeah, find your someone now. <laughs> Introduce yourself. And please share what brings you here. What brings you here? It sounds like you're all bringing quite a lot. <laughs> I would love to know what brings you all here and hopefully afterwards we can, we can talk more about that. And I'm challenging myself to ask what brings me here. And in order to answer that question, of course, because everything is really a philosophical answer, isn't it, when you're a writer, I do have to go back, and, and in order to go back, I have to say first that I've been an activist for, formally, for about 12 years, and throughout that time, I've largely avoided talking about myself at all. Despite the mantra of the person who was political that uh, my lesbian foremothers um, told me about and all the feminists that came before me, it's, it's as if I always managed to keep that person who was political mantra as distant as possible to my own self so that I may never have to do what is actually the hard work here of recognising how injustice, how oppression, how pain, how grief, how loss takes root within ourselves, not just within the structure around us which are a very easy and academic and concrete and abstract way of how to engage with the world. But it is only ever one fragment of the bigger picture. It is only ever one fragment. And so if I stutter or if I stumble over my words, it's because it's not 
it's not normal for me to speak of myself, but I feel like there are some fragments there that may be of use to us tonight um, for us to move forward. So for me, I was born in 1989, and I grew up in a really beautiful family. And the way that that came about is I was adopted from my birth mother and my birth father. And I was adopted into this beautiful um, British and Dutch family via the next door neighbour. So, so my parents to be were were happily in their home and an upper hut. And one of my birth aunties, I'd been speaking of aunties, I'd been passed around from auntie to auntie as they were deciding what to do with me. Um, and one of the aunties in particular went over to her next door neighbour and said, this is baby Cassie, what do you think about her? And that started in motion what happened to be um, a four year adoption process. Um, and I had an incredible childhood because I was adopted by people who really loved me just so dearly. And I knew I was adopted. I would think I was told at four when I had to go through a court process and I'd been told in advance, there might be a nice man who asks you whether or not you want to live with us. Um, and just so you know, you are adopted. And this is the situation. And, and in that conversation, I had a tummy mummy. I think a Plunkett nurse suggested that um, it was the easiest way to explain to a child that you have your mother and then you have your tummy mummy of whose tummy you came out of. And I was very proud of being adopted. I thought it was quite normal. I told everyone at school, got some worrying calls back to my mother um, about why I was sharing these kinds of things. But for me, it was very, very normal. I also grew up with two foster sisters who had also found their way into our home for similar reasons and and together we had a very mixed bag family growing up but it was full of love come teenagehood come queerness come shame of just being a teenager come hormones come all of those things and and that was the time when when I really started to sink into that unknowing, the unknowing of, of who you are and where you come from. And I think everyone goes through it, or most people go through it, and certainly most people questioning their sexuality, or as I like to know, knowing their sexuality, but we have to say we're questioning to make it seem like it's kind of okay. There's no question about it, right? There's no question going on most of the time. But in knowing my sexuality and knowing myself, there was it was obvious there were so many things I did not know and and they all came out. I always think that to be an adopted child is to be like an alien. You have been transplanted into this strange family and nothing smells the same or feels the same but but it can be fine, it can be good for those who get it fine and get it good and for me it was fine and good but there was still something that was causing me to feel like an alien. I remember being asked where I came from when I was young by Māori teachers and, and not knowing. And knowing yet at the same time a shame that I should know who I was. And I didn't know where that come from, came from, but it was a deep knowing. So come as soon as I could get out of Wanganui, <laughs> that's where I grew up, as soon as I can get out, get out of there and, and stop being a small town punk and, and shifting through many different masks and identities of, of making sense of who I was, I made it into Wellington and it was the big smoke, the big city, it was so exciting. And when I was there I found incredible queer young woman who instantly saw me for who I was before I knew who I was, took me in, looked after me, took me to punk rock shows and were there for me the entire time. I soon found myself volunteering for a group called Schools Out, which is similar to Rainbow Youth here, and I became a youth worker by taking care of younger people who were still questioning, not questioning their sexuality and gender. And I was employed by what was the Gay Wellington, Gay Wellington the Wellington Gay Welfare Group, um, which had come from the um, come from the, f the support phone lines in the 80s to the people who fought for homosexual law reform, and and I was given work, given support at that time, and it helped me to really flourish in terms of finding community, finding queer community or rainbow community everywhere I looked. 
Not long after that, it was walking into university, not knowing what the hell I was doing or going on, but just knowing that I, there was something there in that ivory tower that I was looking for and was aiming to get. And what I really found was some ragtag socialist groups who trained me up in Marxist analysis and, <laughs> and told me how to throw a protest. And so that's what I spent the rest of my, um, my university time doing, was, was, was spending time with, with people who knew there was something wrong with the world, had an understanding and an analysis of what that was and a commitment to do something about it. And I didn't care who they were. I knew I just wanted to throw rocks at something or challenge something or do something to be able to, I guess, to whakatinana, to manifest what was feeling inside of me of what I was seeing everywhere, but very rarely was given the words to describe. And not long after that, I met some beautiful, beautiful people, um, especially Kevin Honui. If you've ever met him, you will know who I'm talking about. And I found Te Whana Whana. And Te Whana Whana was a kapahaka group. It is a kapahaka group um, for Takatapui. And slowly, I began to really unravel and reveal myself and learn about myself and take itty-bitty steps to to foster connections with parts of myself that have been too hard to be able to do so before. It was in this time that I was, I was taught all kinds of things. Um, someone described me as a Hermione Granger at that time, walking in and soon learning the real, learning to waiata and having the whakawahine teach me how to poi, how to karanga, how to do... Basically, the whakawahine taught me how to be a Māori woman. They taught me how to be a Māori woman. And it was the gentle men, the gentle tane, who taught me how to foster a, foster a ahua, a, a state of being that was of peace and gentleness. And it was the, um, the mana wahine who really taught me how to stand my ground, the likes of Elizabeth Kirikiri and many other staunch women. And it wasn't long after that that I thought, oh, okay, well, I'm here now. I feel this, I feel that, and actually, I think it's time at age 26 to try to return back home. And anyone who has been adopted knows that, um, yeah, there's so many layers. There's so many layers and layers, and even if in the best situations possible, you can't avoid the layers. Because even though you're just a baby, there are many people who are connected to you and around you, and it turns out they all have their own feelings about the situation. They all have their own things to work through about that. And so I'd put it off. I'd really put it off. I didn't want to do it. It was too big. It was too hard. And there was too much at stake. But like a pull that you feel when you know that you're putting something off, but you must do it. <laughs> I slowly found the courage with all the people who had equipped me, all the community, the activists, the whakawahine, the takatapu, the people who had equipped me, I finally felt ready to make the journey. And so I did what anyone would do. I started asking around, who can help me? Who knows my family? I need to find my family. I hadn't seen my birth parents in years and years. I had no way to contact them. I had some whisperings of knowing that I was from Ngāti Raukawa and some whisperings of where my marae might be, but not enough to really follow a clear path. So I talked to people. I just talked to people. I asked for help. And eventually I ended up cold calling people, cold calling someone that someone else had said, oh, is your last name this? Well, maybe you should talk to this person. And literally cold calling strangers to say, I've been told to speak to you who might know someone who knows me. Many, many dead ends, so many dead ends. And, and in that time, I, I made approaches in lots of different directions, just quietly and as I could, as I could gain the courage. One of the final times that I reached out, I sent an email to a marae in the hope that there might be someone on the other end who could help me. But there was nothing. There was nothing in return. And I thought, that's okay. Maybe it's not meant to be. Maybe it will just happen when it needs to happen. And then I thought, no, fuck it, Cassie. Don't be a coward. Send a follow-up email. Send a follow-up. Just follow 
coming up here. Five minutes later, I get an email from the, the, the chair of the marae. Casey, did you not get my last email? I sent it about three weeks ago. I know all your family, all of the names that you said, I know all of them, we all know them. I've already talked to the marae committee about you and they know you too and they wondered where you had gone. Everybody wants to meet you, they want to welcome you back home. When can you come see us? We can't wait to see the woman that you have become. Whew. I don't think I've ever cried so much over one email. And in that moment, I didn't feel like an alien anymore. I didn't feel like lost. I didn't feel severed and floating through the universe. I felt like someone had seen me and recognized me and gone through the Papa database in the back of their head and thought, you fit in here. This is where you belong. Come back home. That was about five years ago. And I want to be able to say everything is perfect and fine. I was lucky because my marae connected me with my birth mother and we, we formed a relationship and it was, and it is stunning, it is painful, but it is stunning. And, and, and I have to say that I, yes, I feel myself and I feel all these parts of me as, 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 as being connected now and I know who I am and it seems like such a navel gazing thing to do to be like oh yeah but who am I but realizing that that is the thing that holds you strong when you need it the most you can always return to it and it can never ever be taken from you and with that sits all of the tensions you know I know who the main threads who make me up are now and many of them sit in tension. You know, there's, there's the idea of what it means to be the right kind of Māori when you have been literally taken away from your Māori whānau. There is the feeling of wanting to desperately fit in with my, with my whānau who I've come from, but also thinking, where does my takatāpui tanga fit in with that? What if I go back as a queer woman and they don't want me because of who I am? Will I encounter another rejection? feeling like those that looked after me, the people that saved me, my adoption, was also part of a colonial construct that has taken indigenous babies time and time and time and time again as a deliberate mechanism to kill out indigenous communities. That my, my Pākehā parents loved me into this world, but maybe they wouldn't have if I had darker skin and I didn't look like them, and that I would have been in state care like so many other people like me. It felt like I was only one shade of melanin away from a very, very different future. The tension of working up the courage to visit my birth mother every single time that I do it, it takes courage. Because when I sit there with her, all I can see is pain in her eyes. All I can see is pain in her eyes. All I can hear is her guilt when she says, I should have taken you and run. I should have taken you from the hospital and run. Despite the fact that she was institutionalized for years and years and years and she wouldn't have known how to feed me, how to look after me, how to give me the life that I have now. I sit with her grief, I sit with her loss, I try to say, but we're here now, we're here now, mum, it's okay. And it doesn't feel like it's enough. So all of these realities sit in tension with each other. They move and they shift, and, and yet even though they are hard tensions and every tension has a whakapapa that has come from somewhere else that is not a fault of our own, but it has become embedded within to our very DNA, even then I have somehow managed to find a sense of peace in that tension. I think it's because I realise that severance, disconnection and loss and grief is the very natural consequence of a system that seeks to destroy people like us. We had to be disconnected for a new system to be transplanted and built on our grief and loss. And even when I look now around cities, I think, what is the grief and the loss that you have been built on? And yet, 
even though this is a story of grief and loss, I can see like a road map at every single crucial point there were everyday people gathered and organised and taking action so that someone like me could find my way home at every single point. And there's four main moments I want to speak to when people self-organising changed the path of my journey. Firstly, when I got to university and was taken in by those socialist groups and when they gave me an explanation for the world that I could understand, that I could grasp, and with them I learned theory, I organised, I did projects, I protested injustice, and in particular I was mentored by staunch union women. In particular, someone called Helene Prattley, who was like my union goddess, activist, um, older sister. She taught me how to fight for a, for a better working life and took me onto sites of fast paid, low paid fast food workers to say, this is why we need to do what we need to do. Without unions and without socialist groups having been self-organized, I would not have found the people and the knowledge to fight for a just world with a stronger sense of clarity, conviction and comradeship. And next, when I met the people from, the gay, from gay Wellington, the Wellington Gay Welfare Group, from schools out, when I found queer community, it was like I had just walked into this room, not unlike this room right now, and everybody knew each other, and everybody embraced and hugged, and they were the kinds of people that I'd never ever seen before in working class Whanganui, would you believe it? And my mind was just blown. And it was this huge whakapapa of queer men, lesbian women, gay men, bisexual sexual people, trans people who had kept the flame burning over the years to make sure that nobody had to go through what they had to go through again. And I walked into that space ready made, it was there, and said, kia ora, we see you, we see you, welcome, let's get to work. And then thirdly, when I got to Te Whana Whana, you know, and for those who don't know, the whakapapa of Te Whana Whana stretches back to 1998 when Elizabeth Kirikiri and Alofa Aono attended the Gay Games in Amsterdam and it set in motion this, this delegation to go and showcase Takatapui to the world. It set in motion this, this group that began to gather and the purpose of the group was for Takatapui to tell our stories, build our communities and leave a legacy. And with the aforementioned Kevin Honui at the helm, every Monday was like this cool, warm, <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> dose of hope to just sit and sing and eat with people of all different, of all different backgrounds. And if they hadn't kept that fire going, there would have been nothing to walk into where I knew that both my Māori tanga and my sexuality was completely at home in this place. And of course, the final crucial moment was when I stepped out to reach my whanaunga. Had my hapu not organised themselves over decades to maintain their ahika, to keep their fires burning despite constant attacks, I would not have had a marae to go back to. While organising as a Pākehā world, to me, it is simply another way to describe how people have worked together to survive and leave a legacy for the people who come after us. If my marae didn't have a website or an email address, if they hadn't worked hard to keep the kaupapa where they believe the marae is our principal home, then I would not have found my birth mother again. I would have not had studied from my iwi. I would not have found family members I never knew existed. So in some ways, I see my life really as this constellation, as a road map, which is actually one of organizing, of gathering, of reconnecting, and of taking action so that others cannot be lost or severed. So really what brings me here are the people who have organized in the face of oppression. And some of those people are likely to be you. Which brings us to now. When I was younger, my mum used to say, child, you should have been born in the 50s or something, and being part of that women's rights, women's lib movement or something like that. 
You're wasted here. <laughs> and I was always baffled by this because it has never seemed to me that we have actually resolved some of our greater social inequities. But they're still most certainly there. Yes, we have made incredible progress in many ways, but that progress really only relies on people pushing for a better world, constantly pushing for a better world. But the foundations that we rest on are still rotten, and you only need to look to Queen Street, or in our case, Courtney Place or Cuba Street, with our homeless Farno, the glaring, uncomfortable reminder that all is not well between the designer shops. Our poverty rates in Aotearoa are despicable, and the gap between the rich and poor is a silent shadow that no one really wants to talk about for fear of losing what they might already have. And beyond our shores, we are connected whether we like it or not, and COVID has shown us to a global world that is sharply divided between those with power and resource and those who have had it taken from them. It did not happen by accident, it happened by, divine, by design. It has happened because resource-rich countries attracted people who knew that they could make use of that on the backs of different people. It is not a conspiracy theory. It is not a coincidence. It is pure calculation that has led us to a divided world across race, across class, across gender, across religion, across ability, and across access to resources. While COVID has shown glimmers of what we can change when the situation is urgent enough, we have not shifted up our system system to genuinely look after our people and our planet in our current times, which will only ever grow increasingly unprecedented. So what do we do? Well, we do as we have always done. We organize. But we do more of it, and we deepen it, and we take it further than our forebears could ever have imagined. And the best thing is that we all have something to offer. See, for me, the rainbow community or the takatapui community, or as my friends like to say, the alphabet community, because it always seems to be expanding, as you know, <laughs> became a chosen extended family that I needed. And they carried me through my 20s. They guided and mentored me through my 20s. But just like any family, it has moments of complete dysfunction. <laughs> Conflict, tension, rage, grief, all of the things that are a part of being in togetherness with others who are inherently different to you, even if we loosely come under a broad, multicoloured umbrella. But it is the community that has held me and raised me when I was my most severed. It is the fierce young punk femme who held my hand for the first time. It is the bisexual community mother who helped pay for my dream flat, the tuhui hukioi who taught me how to trust myself on late night walks through Courtney Place, the mana wahine who paved the way so I could be here, unapologetic, the artists who challenged and inspired me, the whakawahine who fed me, the wavy non-binary people who inspired me, the Pakia gay men who employed me, the butchers who taught me to drive, the queers who danced with me passionately at the gay club, the trans men who unconditionally loved me. When the world will not love us for who we are, our community is known for finding ways to love each other. Somewhere there has always been one of us loving another back into themselves because we know that's the only way we can get through. So we know how to find joy in places of deep hate, stolen moments of gentle adoration and mind-blowing fucking in a world that has tried to kill us out. And we are here, not all of us, but many of us. And isn't that something that we can offer to others too, who are drenched in hate and forced into oppression? Are we not powerful to still be here despite everything? And shouldn't we give what we have to make sure no one should have to go through such hardship as we have known. Be they pro-democracy fighters in Myanmar or Hong Kong or frontline workers in India or South Africa who will watch middle-class white people get COVID vaccines before they do.
or Black Lives Matter protesters who just want their families to survive the people who are meant to protect and serve them, or our own ahika in this country, the Māori who have kept our own home fires burning so that we may have cultural revitalization now, so we may say kia ora in the streets, so we may do mihi, so I may stand in front of this tuku tuku panel. Everyone who has thanklessly and rewardlessly put into keeping those fires burning so that someone out there doesn't have to remain lost and severed. May they always have a home to come back to. So I invite you, I invite us, because I'm definitely not off the hook. The world will not change on its own. It never does. Ancient divides do not close without pu people pushing for it. Severance does not heal on its own. Yes, it is necessary to write, to read, to tell stories, but it is also necessary to organise to gather together, to take action, to bring all of our unique strengths and experiences to create the world we need. Somewhere, someone and their family depends on it. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. early. <laughs> this never happens, so I'm just maybe going to hand it back to Sam and, and, and you know, I, I don't normally take questions because you never know where they might go. <laughs> I find the question or you never know where they might go, but I do invite, if you have any reflections or thoughts, it doesn't actually need to be a question at all. I'd actually rather not be questioned um, and just to let my words sit for themselves. But if you have a reflection that you might want to share, this is your chance. I'd love to hear it. Hello. I really love that you said something along the lines of all feelings or all emotions or all states of beings have fucker papa, and I just think that that's so important to sit and reflect on that because it's so incredibly true. Where we are is a result of where we've been, and it's about honouring that. So I thank you for for saying that. Cassie, thank you so much. I feel um, when you encouraged us, youth work styles, to um, talk with a person next to you, um, I spoke with uh, a new friend who was talking about uh, coming to this to feel um, topped up, to feel connected. And I just feel so um, in need of that right now, actually. And I think the generosity that you've shown all of us by sharing your story has been exactly what I have needed at this like totally fucking extraordinary time in history when change is so needed um, and we need uh, voices like yours um, to guide the way forward so kanui te mihi ki akwe. Um, so lovely to, uh, to have heard your story this afternoon, thanks Cassie Kiora, thank you very much for the depth of your sharing. And it just makes me sit in awe, actually, of your ability to share in that way and your generosity in doing it. Thank you very much. And uh, I wondered about whether to come to this session. I nearly didn't. 
And as soon as they mentioned Action Station, I felt very glad to be here because it wasn't until I got an email about, I think I saw it about 11.30 or 12 o'clock on Thursday, that I realised about the amendment to the Electoral Act that will enable um, petitions not to occur to make void council decisions to include Maori wards in their local bodies. And so I was able to write a submission and I was able to present it by Zoom yesterday, even though my computer didn't work the first time round and they had to call me back a few hours later. So I'm extremely grateful that Action Station is there. And it's really lovely to be able to put a face to the name of the new director because I didn't have a clue who you were and you come across just so beautifully. So thank you so much. Did anyone else have anything that they wanted to add? Cassie, I feel like it, I, I sent you a message out of the blue just being like, I just want you to rock some people up. <laughs> the, the, the idea behind the Peter Wells lecture is to get someone who, who is an important voice in our community to say things that we need to hear. And I think a lot of the time within queer spaces, we feel like the only thing we're allowed to talk about is the queerness. And queerness means so much of ourselves. And there's so many different layers of that. I know that the work that I've done around um, welfare reform, you know, is informed by my experience as a, as a queer person, but also as an artist and as a person who can't, who hasn't been able to access housing all the time and who has, hasn't been able to access employment all the time and a lot of the volunteers for that project are from the Rainbow community and a lot of us within Rainbow communities do a lot of this work that is around healing us and um, just really want to, I just really appreciate you speaking to that and speaking to that through yourself and your own personal experiences as well as the way that you're connected to groups and organisations and communities of organisation. And thank you so much. Can we get another round of applause? Just because I've got the mic and I can keep Speaking, if I choose to, I just, I just want to thank Sam for inviting me to be here. Um, it can be quite an intimidating thing to, to do a lecture, I guess. Even the word is, is quite an interesting word. And, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this because I do think that too rarely we have opportunities where we get to hear from young, queer, Māori, takatāpui people um, from lecterns. And so I do not take this moment for granted um, and I just want to repeat that it was the elders who came before me that have enabled me to be able to be here and even to be in this space and I, I just really invite you always to um, connect across generations because I think one of the things that our current society has done is packaged us off in real different um, generations but actually we have so much to learn from each other and still so much to do together so um, so that's that's my final thought and yes join the action station mailing list and and we can speak more <laughs>